Today is Valentine's Day, and so Debbie and I are going to discuss the secrets of a happy marriage. Now, you guys are like, you guys have a happy marriage? Well, you're going to find out. Uh, John Durham may have caught Hillary red-handed, and the only question now is, will the crooked one get away with it again? We're getting the results, the practical, empirical results of the Texas law, and I think it's going to help convince the Supreme Court that Roe versus Wade should go. And entertainment writer Christian Toto will join me. We're going to talk about how Hollywood became so deranged on identity politics and everything else. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Today is, well, Valentine's Day. And so we thought we would do a little Valentine's Valentine's Day Day special. (laughs) (laughs) And and we thought we would actually talk about uh, relationships and about marriage and kind of what makes marriages marriages tick. Now, obviously, I don't know if we have a representative marriage, but I, I would say I think we do have a happy marriage. Now, people say, listen, the man's opinion does not matter. It all depends on the wife. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> apparently, oh. apparently, you're like sovereign on this question. Interesting. As to whether we have a happy marriage. Yeah. What would you say? Yeah, I would say we absolutely have a happy marriage. Okay, now, yeah. now I think there's the, uh, the opening line in... Um, is it War and Peace or is it Anna Karenina? That he, he says that happy marriages are all the same, but unhappy marriages are unhappy in different ways. So do you think that there is a set of ingredients that makes a happy marriage? You, you printed this thing out you were mm-hmm, showing me mm-hmm. where I guess they have couples who write in mm-hmm. and offer comments about what they think makes a marriage mm-hmm. successful. But yeah, yeah. So it's not so, well, you can refer to the comments, but let's just also talk about our own experience. What do you think are the the two or three key ingredients that make marriages work? Well, I'm not going to go into one of them because it's rated R. What? (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, you can can take whatever you like from that. But um, also, though, I think that communication is super important. And I think that both of us definitely communicate. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people ask if we talk about politics and, you know, all of those things. What do we talk about? We do talk about politics. But, of course, that's not all we talk about. We have a lot of other interests that that we, you know, share. And, and uh, also, I think we're both very, we're kind people and we're kind to each other. And I think that goes a long way. Because I mean, it's interesting. We have friends who are, well, we would call them sort of combative and yellers and so they will i mean they've had long marriages and so they will excoriate each other they'll use insulting names and they and they let it bounce off each other so their marriages actually are fine but we don't do that we're actually quite gentle with each other and if you get flustered about something it flusters me and and vice versa so yeah yeah, I think you're right. We we don't use that. We're, we don't use that model. Now, interestingly, there's, there's an article here. Yeah. This is from The Mirror. This is actually British. The recipe for a perfect marriage includes two huge arguments a month. Now, it, it doesn't say just argue. It talks about six meaningful conversations, three long walks, and two barnstorming arguments. Oh, <laughs> wow. Now, do we... Well, we have, we have more than six meaningful conversations. We have six sure. meaningful conversations per day. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we do take walks, although yes. perhaps not, 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 not in the winter. It's too cold. But, but we yeah. don't have the arguments. I mean... Uh, We've had what I would say. Well, I, I would say like yesterday we came as close to a disagreement as like we've come in Spell a while. Spell it out. What was the nature so of that So basically, you know, I have to tell everybody. Uh, so Dinesh did an event uh, in Idaho this past weekend. And unfortunately, it was not one of those trips where you can just come and go, you know, direct flight or whatever. It was one stop and all of those things. So he was gone all weekend he was gone from friday noon until like 10 o'clock at night last night 
And um, it, he calls me when he gets to the airport or whatever. He goes, honey, I have this radical idea. And I said, <laughs> I said, what's your radical idea? Well, you know, as you know, we are doing a movie right now. And Dinesh always does an accompanying book with the movie. So he's working on a book that goes with the movie. That's 2000, 2000 Mules. Mules. So the, um, and the book will come out later than the movie and it will, but the, the idea is you can put more comprehensive stuff yes, in a book. Absolutely. So, so you have more detail in the book and everything. Well, it turns out that my husband doesn't know how to say the word no. So he gets all kinds of media requests. Oh yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. So there goes his whole day. But because of that, he hasn't really had time to sit down and write the book. So last night when he was at the airport, he says he had this radical idea. He said he was going to, and I'm not kidding, get up at two in the morning, every morning and work from two to four and then for, or two to five and then from five to six work on the podcast. I thought I was going to lose it. <laughs> well, you thought this was nuts. Oh, yes. I sent you a you're nuts emoji. <laughs> and then I had to go, I'm nuts about you, actually. <laughs> but no, seriously. So so you work so hard. You work nonstop. But there are some things that I think you do that I feel can, can actually not benefit you health-wise. So here's a good point, so, and that is that, um, you know, so you're... Um, I think that the reason we don't have friction on all these points, even on, well, another big issue, of course, and this is a case of constant, oh. is my diet. Oh, yeah. And my working out habits. <laughs> now, the point is, <laughs> some might say you're a little no. bossy. Yeah. And some might say you're on me, you know, but the reason I don't take it that way or I don't take it the wrong way, I think is because I know it's well motivated. So you're motivated by, and you're motivated really not even by your convenience, you're motivated by my welfare. So your idea is, Dinesh, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be around a long time. So you need to eat properly. And uh, and exercise <laughs> is really good for you. And I, yeah. you know, you will like watch my sugar levels. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both, all... we're both pre-diabetic. So mm -hmm. we both need to watch our sugar, right? And right. and so now we're eating, like, he's not supposed to eat chocolate, but, but now... But our, our interpretation of pre-diabetic differs dramatically. To me, pre-diabetic is another way of saying you are not, not diabetic. diabetic. <laughs> Just, it's, it's sort of like saying I am, you know, I am pre-being in the coffin. Yeah, I'm pre-being in the coffin. I'm not but in I'm the not coffin. I'm not dead yet. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no. But but so so we, we've been, we found these chocolates that are really good. They're, they're chocolate with no sugar but i always tell you but honey you have to watch the chocolate because it has a lot of fat so even though it doesn't have sugar it has fat and we have to be very careful because again we have may i just note that sugar-free chocolates are really expensive we supposedly, oh, we supposedly yeah. found the best sugar-free chocolates and but they were literally i think they were five dollars each and once you ordered them and and you factor in the tax it was seven dollars per piece oh, per piece and, and, they, so, and the piece was like this i mean little. i couldn't even enjoy tiny. them it was tiny I, no, and it, it it was good, but it wasn't that good. Okay. <laughs> so, Let's talk about the importance yeah. of, do you think, some people say, and in fact, apparently when young people are asked, what are you looking for in a mate? The answer, the number one answer is a sense of humor. Oh. Do you think a sense of humor is important in a marriage? And um, mm -hmm. and also... Well, I mean, it's it's a bonus. It's a bonus. It's not important. It, you, the person can be kind, compassionate, patient with you, all those things. I mean, there are people who have no they're, sense of humor, they have, and right, they are nice people. And they are nice people. But when you have all the other qualities that you have, plus you're really super funny and you make me laugh out loud pretty much every day and every night, I think that's a bonus. I think that's like the icing on the cake. Well, I think the reason I make her laugh is because, um, all the, because I'm, I'm. Because you're funny. I, well, no, it's, cause, it's because I'm straight laced on the surface. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, very straight laced. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do see the ridiculous aspect of human nature, um, yeah. and I think you know one one way humor works the best is if you're willing to turn that same lens on yourself and yeah, self-deprecating. Yeah, because yeah. then it's then people can see that the humor isn't 
really ridicule. Like I like I, I make jokes about you, but they're not mean. They're never aimed at injuring you no, or you make fun of my germophobia. I make fun of your yeah. germophobia and other things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Happy Valentine's Day to you. <laughs> Happy Valentine's I Day. I love Eddie. you. Oh, I love you too. One of the things Debbie and I uh, know from personal experience, but you can also see it from his public actions, is what a nice guy Mike Lindell is. As a hurricane, he's there to help. And the latest is he's helping the truckers. The truckers. He's sending, he's sending how many pillows? Thousands of pillows. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is a guy who just has a huge heart. And for this reason, we think uh, that we want to support him every which way. It's our way of uncanceling Mike Lindell. Mm -hmm. And he makes it easy because he has good products. And he also offers good deals. Well, mm -hmm. here's a good deal. This is on the Giza Dream Sheet, 60% off, $39.99. What a deal. And, and plus, Mike is throwing in his book. So if you make an order from my pillow, Mike will send you a copy of his book. Yeah, and it's a really good book. It, it's a window into his life and his the ordeal that he that he went through and his his uh, Christianity, how we found Christ. I mean, it's amazing. It's a book about redemption. Yeah. And it's a book about suffering, but it's also about transcending that suffering. Uh, it's very moving. So here's how you do it. Go go to MyPillow.com or call 800-876-0227. That number again, 800-876-0227. By the way, discounts on the whole range of Mike's products, 150 products. Um, and you can call the number or go to MyPillow.com. Now, to get these discounts, you got to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. What actual impact has the Texas pro-life law had on the number of abortions in the state of Texas? When the law passed, I mentioned that a number of the abortion clinics were closing down or were restricting their operations. All very good news. But it was not clear what the actual effect would be. And now we have, well, just an early glimpse that the Texas law is working. Now, according to the uh, data, this is coming from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, the number of abortions in Texas fell 60% the very first month under this abortion law. And the abortion law, by the way, does not allow abortions uh, it's a heartbeat bill. Once cardiac activity is detected, that's usually around six weeks. So this is a, a law that essentially stops abortion in its tracks. And it doesn't have any real exceptions, no exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. It's a law across the board. And the law has the funny provision or the interesting provision that it allows private citizens to sue uh, and actually get $10,000. Uh, from abortion providers and abortion sort of enablers. And interestingly, there have been no such lawsuits yet. No one has actually filed a case. And um, so the law, however, has had a powerful deterrent effect. Planned Parenthood, of course, of course, was screaming about the law from the beginning. And they're actually screaming even more now that the actual number of abortions has gone down. So here are the numbers. And in August, this is right before the law, there were 5,400 abortions in Texas statewide. Uh, and uh, in September, uh, that number plummets to 2,200. So it drops more than half, drops 60% to be, to be precise. Now, some of it, you could say, well, the abortions aren't being prevented because someone in Texas could cross over the border, say into Louisiana, or go someplace else and get an abortion there. That's possible. And of course, even if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, returns abortion decisions to the states, probably about half the states would have uh, some, if not many, restrictions on abortion. But again, people could leave the state and go to a sort of, let's call it a, a state with liberal or permissive Roe versus Wade style uh, laws on abortion and get their abortions there. Planned Parenthood issues a statement saying that these numbers are, quote, devastating. They show the devastating impact of the law. So think about it. For them, uh, fewer abortions is devastating. I guess if abortions were up 60%, Planned Parenthood would be elated. This is a pro-abortion organization. It's even the word pro-choice is really not all that appropriate here. Now, there's been no 
big ruckus in Texas, no social convulsion, the state isn't turned upside down, we haven't seen any, you know, coat hanger abortions, none of that. So I think the Supreme Court looking at all this, and by the way, courts um, in Texas, but also the Supreme Court, there have been a number of efforts, emergency appeals to the court to to put the, a stay on this Texas abortion law pending the resolution of all the litigation that surrounds it. But the courts have basically said, no, no, we're, we're not going to put a stay. With the law remains in effect. We can argue about the constitutionality. The cases can make their way through the courts, but we're not, we're not putting the law on the shelf. And uh, I think that this has been uh, a, a very interesting experiment because the Supreme Court can say, well, listen, uh, clearly if abortion is returned to the states, there's not going to be a big national hullabaloo, all the hysteria predicted by the left. And perhaps this is something that, that some of us on the right might have worried about, that there's going to be all kinds of disruptions to society. But no, the Texas law and the experience of the Texas law, and we're now, of course, you know, this law went into effect, what, last September? So we're a good six months into the law. And it's turned out to be just fine. So I think all of this will embolden the Supreme Court to do what it should do legally, constitutionally, and morally. But on top of all the legal and constitutional arguments, there's now a new one. It's called the practical argument. I guess if you talk to my grandparents, they would say aches and pains are part of the normal wear and tear of life. There's nothing you can do about them. But now there is. There's a 100% drug-free solution. It's called Relief Factor. Now, Relief Factor is based on the idea that inflammation is the source of aches and pains, and Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more and more. Why? Because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer. She's got frozen shoulder, and Relief Factor has been a total game changer for her. And she knows, by the way, if she doesn't take it regularly, the pain's going to come right back. So she's made a vow never to be without it again. Being able to lift her arm exercise is super important to her. Relief Factor is a tool she needs. She's glad she's got it. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. You'll see. Order the three-week quick start. Great price. The discounted price of just $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to learn more about this offer. That number, 833-690-7246 or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. John Durham is the, uh, well, he may not be an inventor, but he's the practitioner of the tortoise school of investigation. He is a plotter. He moves very deliberately. He only very slowly, like a tortoise, brings his neck out of his shell. Uh, sometimes he pulls it back in. But I have to say that as someone who had worried that with Biden's election, Durham would essentially disappear, he has not disappeared. This is a kind of sure-footed tortoise. And from his filings, and this is a guy who doesn't have press conferences, not, not a lot of um, public brouhaha, he, he puts his findings in his legal briefs. And the latest one has a very revealing tidbit. It's only a tidbit, but it's a tidbit that makes you go, whoa. Uh, what he shows in the latest filing is that this guy, Sussman, and Sussman, let's remember, has been indicted for lying. Uh, this is a top lawyer with the Hillary Clinton campaign. But what Sussman was doing, Michael Sussman, is working with a technology executive. Who's a technology executive? Well, he's been sort of unmasked now. He's a new star, uh, senior vice president Rodney Joffe. And also with a, a healthcare company called Spectrum Health. So here's the deal. Sussman, working with the technology executive, Joffe, and Spectrum Health, were spying on not just the Trump campaign. That was actually known. Uh, and we know that they were spying not to find um, collusion with Russia. They did not have any reason to believe there was. In fact, we now know there wasn't. What they were doing is to try and spin a narrative, a false narrative of collusion, but they needed something to point to, like, look at this, look at this. And so they were looking for that. And it turns out, according to Durham, that these people were spying not just on, on the Trump campaign, they were spying on Trump Tower, and they were spying on Donald Trump's Central Park West apartment building. And then this is the crusher. They were spying on the executive office of the president of the United States. In other words, they were spying on Trump while he was in the White House. So think about it. You've got these external groups 
And you might say, well, how can you spy on the White House? How do you even have that kind of access? Well, it turns out that the internet company, this is New Star, had a contract with the government in which they were uh, providing resolution services for the White House's servers. And what, and this contract was obviously a contract to protect the security and the equipment at the White House, but essentially what happened is this guy Joffe decided to use the access granted by that contract to do this kind of spying, to look for derogatory information on Trump. Now, I think we should let the significance of this uh, sink in. Uh, you've got a rival campaign and the leader of the rival campaign, which is a, a top lawyer, now, I don't think that Michael Sussman would do all of this on his own. It's not like he decided, well, you know what? I'm just going to go rogue. I'm going to spy on the president of the United States. No, this is coming from the highest ranks of the campaign. And I would not be a bit surprised if it's coming from Hillary herself. At the very least, did she know about it? I mean, these were the exact same questions asked about Watergate. Not that Nixon ordered the burglary. He actually didn't. But he knew about it. And he made all kinds of efforts to cover it up. And it seems here that this is a plot hatched at the top levels of the Clinton campaign. Now, Trump is out with a statement uh, saying, quote, that in an earlier time, these are crimes. I mean, there's an element of treason here because you're essentially violating the fundamental pact uh, between the two parties that we are competitors in a fair fight. Uh, and, and apparently what's going on here is they were looking for a smear on Trump. Uh, that would give them, that would hand the election to Hillary. And Trump goes, this kind of treason would, quote, in an earlier generation, quote, would have been punishable by death. And, you know, I think clinically that's probably, that's probably true. We only have to look back to Hillary Clinton's actions to see what an absolute snake this woman is. Um, I retweeted yesterday Hillary's statement uh, from the campaign by her. It says computer scientists have apparently uncovered a covert server linking the Trump organization to a Russian based bank. This tweet, by the way, a few days before the election, October 31st, 2016. And she, she uh, links to a statement from her then special policy advisor, Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan, now high official in the Biden administration. And um, she also links a little bit later in a second statement to an article in Slate magazine. And let's remember that the Clinton campaign planted the article in, Sta in Slate magazine. Let's remember the Clinton campaign is the ones that set off, that tipped off the FBI to start this investigation. And the computer scientists were scientists working at Sussman's direction uh, and under Joffe's direction to find these uh, connections that they could then use to smear Trump. So the whole thing r is, is rotten from start to finish. And to me, the only real question is, I mean, I'm not all that surprised by the fact that the media is pretending a ho-hum attitude about this. Um, you can't look to the media. You know, we've looked to the media in the past for cues about how we should feel about things. Is this a big scandal? Well, what's the press saying about it? Turns out that there are big scandals that the press says nothing about. And there are scandals that are no big deal. Uh, or even bogus scandals. Oh, Trump and Russia bounties and the press is all over it and screaming about it. So we've got to train our instincts not to pay attention to the press uh, and not to take our emotional cues from the press because these people are completely fake. They're propagandists for one side and for the they're hostile propagandists to our point of view. And, and I sort of marvel here at Hillary's ability, her constant ability to stay one step ahead of the posse. I hope that Durham, I really hope that Durham here, the tortoise, is willing to follow, perhaps methodically, but nevertheless unyieldingly, follow this path all the way to the top so that the, the phrase lock her up goes from being a rally slogan to being a well-deserved reality. Fruits and veggies need to be an essential part of your diet, and you know this, and so do I. But uh, turns out most of us don't eat the amount of fruits and veggies that we need, maybe because we don't know how much we need, maybe because we don't like some of the veggies and so on. So the bottom line of it is we need it. Well, here's a solution. It's called balance of nature. And Debbie and I are sold. We do this every day. We take three capsules of the veggies right here three capsules of the fruits, and you know what? We're done. It's awesome. Um, Debbie also swears by this. It's called the fiber and spice. She says, boy, it's going to keep my body regular, and it also helps, she says, with her acid reflux. 
So look, this is stuff that actually works. Invest in your health, invest in your life. Join me, experience the balance of nature difference for yourself for years to come. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. How did Roseanne Boylan die? This is a question I've addressed previously on the podcast. It seems very unlikely now that the medical examiner's decision that Roseanne Boylan died due to a drug overdose is correct. Um, It seems also suspicious that the police uh, promptly uh, immolated her body uh, without even contacting the family. They just went ahead and, and did it. And so that by itself um, appears to suggest some kind of a cover-up. And uh, now we see that there's video, very incriminating video, that shows a Capitol Police officer named um, Morris, uh, Lisa Morris, literally beating, I'm sorry, Lila Morris, literally beating Roseanne Boylan with a wooden stick and with a steel baton. This is in the, um, uh, as she was in the tunnel. And um, this footage has been very disturbing to anyone who sees it now, but it disturbed people at the time. Uh, there was a, a friend of, of Boylan named Justin Winchell. He was right next to her. And if you look at the video, you can see the astonishment on his face when he sees Lila Morris hitting Boylan. Uh, a woman who was defenseless and a woman who was not providing any kind, wasn't using any kind of force. And you can hear Justin Winchell saying, she's going to die. She's going to die. He knew that she was, in effect, being beaten as it looked to him to death. Now, uh, there's a, um, in Texas, a guy named Gary McBride of Decatur, Texas. This is a kind of, uh, he's an entrepreneur, but he's also kind of a self um, starter video guy. And this is a guy who has been studying the video, the available video on Roseanne Boylan, and he made a formal complaint with the Capitol Police to their Department of Investigations to look into this, and he provided supporting video. He also said that there must be body cam video that shows from the police's point of view what happened, and he asked that that video be released. Now, again, very suspiciously, the uh, even though uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, petitions have been foiled, including, by the way, by Roseanne Boylan's family, the uh, Shania Hughes, who's from the... Um, Metropolitan Police Department says we're not releasing any uh, body cam footage. Quote, the release of this information could interfere with the enforcement proceedings by revealing the direction and pace of the investigation. What? This is gobbledygook. Uh, Basically, what they're saying is we don't want to show you what we can see on the body cam footage. But interestingly, they have apparently done some kind of an investigation, or at least they claim to have. And we have this statement from David K. Augustin, Director of Risk Management at the MPD um, uh, Internal Affairs Bureau. Quote, The use of force within this investigation was determined to be objectively reasonable. And those are the two words that really struck me objectively. So objectively is uh, not just from the police's point of view, but from a reasonable third party's point of view, this was a reasonable use of force. Now, again, um, this is not apparent on the video. Uh, On the video, what you see appears to be just an appalling and unnecessary use of force against an unarmed woman that ends her life. Was Why was it necessary to use that kind of a force? Why beat a woman who's prostrate on the ground? Um, And um, in such a way that that actually ends her life. And um, this, I think, uh, seems to suggest that there were two female Trumpsters who were apparently killed uh, by the police. Well, in one case, we know uh, Ashley Babbitt. In the case of Roseanne Boylan, we're trying to get to the truth of the matter. But what we're getting is obfuscation, what we're getting is obstruction, and what what we're getting are statements by the police, in this case, Captain David K. Augustin, that are manifestly preposterous. 
Ronald Reagan saw it 40 years ago. Massive inflation that we haven't seen since then, well, until today. In Reagan's words, inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. Right now, your retirement accounts are under attack, thanks to the inflationary policies of this administration. What's the solution? Birch Gold. If you haven't yet called Birch Gold, these are the people I trust to help you diversify your 401ks and IRAs into gold. Well, then you're missing the boat. Actually, you're treading water without a life vest. Birch Gold has your life vest. Let them help you convert an IRA a 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. With thousands of satisfied customers, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, you can trust Birch Gold to protect your savings. Text Dinesh to 989898 and you'll get a free information kit about gold. Reagan knew the biggest threat to our wealth. Protect yours now. Go ahead, text Dinesh to 989898 to get your free information kit on gold now. I'm very pleased, guys, to welcome to the podcast a a writer um, and a journalist, an award-winning journalist, film critic, founder of HollywoodInToto.com. His name is Christian Toto. He's also the author of a new book. It's called Virtue Bombs, How Hollywood Got Woke and Lost Its Soul. Hey, Christian, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. You and I have talked, well, several times in the past because you, oh, yeah. you've been covering the Hollywood beat. Uh, and um, so you've covered some of the film projects I've done and also some of the controversies, some of my Razzies, including my cherished uh, Worst Actor uh, Award for playing myself. Uh, talk about a little bit how you got interested in the Hollywood. There are not a guys, not a lot of guys like you on the conservative side who watch and study and analyze Hollywood. How did you get into it? Well, I'm a failed art major, and uh, I segued from art to journalism, and I really just wanted to be a film critic. That's what my passion was, and I eventually got there. And then I looked around at the landscape and thought, well. No one is really reviewing films from a right of center perspective. That's who I am. That's what I believe. And there really should be someone doing that. And there, you know, today there are a couple, John Nolte, Kyle Smith, but there's really not good representation, to use the left's language, in this arena. So I decided to just be open and honest about who I am, what I do. And it's become more and more important in recent years. Now, the subtitle of your book is about ho- how Hollywood got woke, and we'll talk about that mm-hmm. in a second. But And you say, and lost its soul. And this would seem to imply to me that you are <laughs> appealing to an older mm-hmm. idea of Hollywood that, you know, I mean, Hollywood has always had all kinds of weirdos in it, it seems to me. Even going back to sure. the old days, I'm surprised when you zoom into the lives of Grace Kelly, Marilyn Monroe, and so many mm-hmm. others, you realize, wow, these people lived really messed up lives. Lives, but even so, what is the soul that you're referring to that is now in danger or has already been lost? It's the creative soul. I agree. There's lots of tawdry business in Hollywood, for sure. Any business, you can find some some uh, darkness there, but it's certainly worse in Hollywood. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. But, you know, it was a time where you could tell a joke, you could tell a story, you could craft an, a novel. And, 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 you know, listen, if it would sell then that'd be successful and you'd make more of it. But what we're seeing now is, is sort of a uh, uh, something is interrupting the creative flow that you start to tell a story. Well, I can't do it that way or I can't tell that joke or this is not you know diverse enough or this is unpleasant or this will rankle the wrong interest group. And that's where the soul comes in, the creative soul. I think that it's in harm's way. And you describe this process. I mean, it's kind of fascinating to see how it has crept into, well, not just movies, but it's crept into music and it's crept even into comedy. Uh, let's talk about comedy for a second, because comedy relies on being able to poke uh, fun at a taboo. It relies on overturning, if you can say, the cultural apple cart. But here we have this sort of woke culture that is exercising its big supervisory glance over comedy and it seems to have largely killed comedy, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. When was the last time you went to a movie and saw a really rip roaring comedy? You laughed, you laughed. You had to tell all your friends, you've got to go see this. You know, I'm thinking maybe The Hangover or Bridesmaids, old school. You know, they could be R rated for sure, but they were just really funny. 
and outrageous and bawdy. And we don't see much of that these days. Uh, you look at late night TV, which is technically the home of comedy, especially satirical comedy. It's all one way of thinking, one group think. You can't tell this joke. It's that joke. And honestly, they're not even funny. So they, they've lost the, They've lost the plot in that way. How do you think that this uh, woke culture uh, made its way into Hollywood? Uh, we had an interview with uh, Isaiah Washington in the my last film, Trump Card, and he made the point that he said he it thinks it's more related to the gay issue than anything else. He said, you have all these small town southern boys and Midwestern guys and they come to Hollywood and they come from places where they felt constrained in their sexuality. I guess it was their parents and their preacher uh, and the small town mentality. And so Hollywood to them represents the opposite. They interpret freedom as freedom from these moral constraints. Do you think that that's an important element here? But obviously, there's also the, the, the racial element. There's also the the Me Too element. How did these elements kind of come together to, in a sense, completely overtake Hollywood? You know, it's funny. Uh, Hollywood often reflects the culture, but often it reflects a subset of the culture. And I think what Hollywood is doing right now is looking at sort of the Twitter mob and saying, OK, this this subset believe certain things and certain uh, relationships and certain ethos. And we're going to really kind of hammer, uh, kind of zoom in on that. But it doesn't really reflect the larger American population. So I, I think it's sort of a twisted thing. And, you know, it, it's just it's all over the culture. I mean, it's on universities. It's, it's academia. It's Hollywood. It's sports. It's news. So I, I don't think Hollywood can be immune to what's going on with this sort of woke mindset. It, it couldn't help but embrace it and 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 subs get subsumed by it, really. What I find interesting, you have a chapter called How Taylor and Jimmy Got Woke, and I take that in a broader sense that you've got young actors and actresses, and some of them come from fairly conservative backgrounds. Reese Witherspoon, for example, growing up in the South, Taylor Swift, and they start off kind of normal and clean cut. Uh, Jimmy, of course, refers to Jimmy Kimmel, and I remember the old Jimmy Kimmel, and he was kind of a straightforward guy, had a good sense of humor. Uh, he, I think he was, if I'm not mistaken, on The Man Show, so there was a kind of almost exaggerated manliness being portrayed with a humorous aspect to it. But suddenly this guy has gone like hot hard left. Uh, and, and do you think this is just a, a career move on the part of Taylor Swift, Jimmy Kimmel? They're like, look, I'm in a, I'm in a culture where I have to play this game. Uh, or do you think that they've undergone genuine uh, ideological conversions uh, and they now themselves have become not just followers, but leaders of the woke mob? I mentioned earlier in the book that fear is such a powerful force in Hollywood. It's always been that way and it's now worse. So for Jimmy Kimmel, I think he's afraid to be that bold, brash, man show kind of guy. He knows that he could get in real trouble, that he won't get invited to the right parties, maybe he won't get the right guests. With, with Taylor Swift, it's interesting because she was aggressively apolitical. And that's important to think about. She wasn't left, she wasn't right, she didn't kind of get involved with it at all. And the press, just absolutely just savaged her and said, you can't stay out. You've got to make a choice. Of course, you know the choice they want you to make, you know, vote for Hillary in 2016, for example. And so I think they were partially bullying her to be more progressive. And then she did it. And now they love her even more. She gets accolades from the press. Uh, Miss Americana was a movie she made about sort of that transformation. So it's such an interesting ecosystem. And uh, it, there's no accident why people become who they are. And what you're saying is that, because see, normally if somebody intimidates you into doing something, you're going to harbor some resentment and you're going to be very angry that they made you do this and you're going to look for clever ways you can strike out at them. What I find interesting is that with Jimmy Kimmel, with Taylor Swift, it's like they're beaten into submission and then they sort of become converts and then you don't have to push them anymore. It's almost like they now know how they should behave and they're actually happy to behave that way. Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's a reward system in place. Look at Howard Stern. I listened to Howard Stern for years. If any of his material really resurfaced today, he would be done. But what Howard Stern cleverly did, perhaps for self for survival, is he basically went anti-Trump. He went pro-vaccine mandates. He basically in, in, embraced all the accepted narratives and they're not going to cancel him because he's now a warrior for their side. So that's an interesting element of as well. If you if you go a certain way, you could your your past is forgiven. 
That's fascinating. So it's absolution, but the price of it is that you have to go woke. This is a very interesting yeah. book, and you know it has a level of concreteness and detail that I find really fascinating. Christian Toto, you're doing great work. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Everyone should have the right to express themselves freely, but sadly, the big tech monopoly has opted for silencing tactics and censorship. To fight back against big tech's control of the internet, I use ExpressVPN. Now, big tech giants make their money by tracking your searches, video history, everything you click on, by building a profile on you and then selling off your sensitive data. When you use the ExpressVPN app on your computer or phone, you anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address and ExpressVPN encrypts your data so no one can see it. What I like most is the simplicity. It just takes one click to protect all your devices. That's why ExpressVPN is rated number one by Business Insider. Let's stop allowing big tech to revoke our rights to free speech. Secure your internet with the VPN I trust for online protection. Visit expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash Dinesh to get three extra months free with my exclusive link. Go to expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. Comedian Dave Chappelle has become a controversial figure on the left, uh, not because he is making conservative or right-wing jokes, but because he is not accepting the parameters of identity politics. This is a guy who's a politically incorrect comedian for the obvious reason that that's where the humor is. That's where people, those are the taboos of our society, and it's natural that that's going to be the place where comedians are going to go. But the left is sort of on a crusade to get Chappelle. And here's an article in the LA Times, uh, Dave Chappelle rebuffs affordable housing in Ohio hometown. So if you read the article, it appears like Dave Chappelle is just a, you know, callous guy. He's a rich guy in a big town. And, you know, the town is considering some affordable housing and Chappelle is not going to have any of it. In fact, the article has the headline, I am not bluffing. Apparently what happens is we're talking about the town of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and uh, they um, they were going to build um, 140 new homes on 53 acres of land. This is a developer in the area. And the, the town council had said, listen, if you're going to do that, we want you to also build an affordable housing component with some townhomes and duplexes because uh, home prices have just escalated in this town. Now, um, Dave Chappelle shows up at the council meeting. Uh, Dave Chappelle was apparently planning to make a pretty big investment in the, the town. Where he's going to uh, put up a new restaurant, a new comedy club. And basically, Dave Chappelle said, quote, I am not bluffing. I will take it all off the table. That's all. Thank you. So in other words, if you go ahead with this uh, whole project, uh, I'm going to pull my business out of the town. And apparently that was enough leverage for the town to vote two to two with one guy abstaining. And so essentially it's going to be no affordable housing in uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio, at least no new affordable housing. Now, uh, the LA Times article, and this is typical of the coverage of this, seems to suggest that Chappelle just doesn't want like poor people or relatively poor people moving into the town. But the moment you look a little more closely, you realize that's actually not what the fight is about at all. So this is a smear on Chappelle. Here's the truth of the matter. You've got Yellow Springs. It's a really small town, 4,000 people. It's got a kind of a college town vibe. An outside developer comes in and this guy bought a huge plot of land, 50 acres. They want to build 140 very costly homes, costly by comparative standards. So the typical Ohio home is about $200,000 and these homes are going to be three hundred to $600,000. And apparently a lot of residents of the town like the small town, college, even village feel. The local council, by the way, is called the village council. Uh, they don't want outside developers changing the complexion of the town. And so uh, what the town council did in sort of um, its usual kind of muscling style is they basically said to the developer, listen, we'll let you make this development um, of, um, of uh, all these um, homes, the 140 homes, if uh, you create some, if you essentially give us some of that land 
to build affordable housing. And the developer goes, okay, well, I'll let you build it affordable housing. I'm not going to build it, but I'll let you build it on this land. So it was kind of one of those, you could call it the price of doing business, a little bit of the town council shakedown. And so the point is that Dave Chappelle didn't oppose the affordable housing. He opposed the development. He didn't want all these new homes popping up in the area, changing the complexion of town. He was hardly alone in this. But what the developer did was focus on the affordable council and then go affordable housing and go running to the LA Times and go, listen, Dave Chappelle's against affordable housing. No, Dave Chappelle wasn't against the affordable housing. The affordable housing was merely the kind of add-on to the development itself. So the the fight was over the development. Should this town allow all these new homes to be built? Yes or no. Uh, now, of course, the irony of all this is that the town council decided we'll shelve the affordable housing component, but they decided to go ahead uh, with the development. So in some way, Chappelle didn't get everything he wanted. In fact, he didn't get the thing he wanted most, which is to stop this accelerated pace of development in the first place. Uh, the net effect is that the development goes, continues apace, the affordable housing is put to the side. But the point I'm trying to make is that while they're making it look like Dave Chappelle is against affordable housing, what he was really against is, as he saw it, accelerated development in a town that he wanted to stay relatively the same. There's an interesting debate going on in conservative precincts over the idea of the common good. And there are a group of writers and thinkers, um, the Harvard legal scholar Adrian Vermeule, the writer Sora Bamari of the New York Post, and um, the Notre Dame scholar Patrick Deneen and others have been arguing that we need a conservatism that is just not about or not solely about liberty and the protection of individual liberties and rights. Uh, it should include that but it should also focus on the idea of the common good of the community, of the whole society. And these are writers who don't hesitate to see the state, the government, as being an instrument of this common good. That's the point, ultimately, of having a government, one that doesn't just protect your rights, doesn't just protect your safety, but also advances in appropriate ways the common good. Now, to certain ways of thinking, this idea of the common good is very suspect. Uh, a lot of libertarians think it is like downright communist because uh, our goal should be freedom. The government should basically be leave you alone. You should be free to make your own decisions, live your own life. Why are they telling you what to do? Uh, and what is this nonsense about uh, the common good? Well, uh, let's look at it uh, this way. Um, the family, which is an institution within society, uh, does protect individuality. In a, in a family, you want children, for example, to develop their own personality. Obviously, the adults in a family are looking for uh, their own uh, success and fulfillment, a happy life within the family. So there are individual goods involved, but the family also involves a common good. Uh, in fact, someone has pointed out the family operates according to the principles of strict communism from each according to his ability or her ability to each according to their needs. That's the principle of a successful family. Now, uh, the family is not the same thing, of course, as the state because in a family you have these mutual bonds of affection. And let's remember also in a family with regard to children, they, they get a lot from their parents. They don't give a lot. Well, they give affection, but they don't support their parents or give um, in the measure of what they're receiving. But let's remember that the, pro, the period of being a child is somewhat probationary. You're going to go on to be an adult. You're going to go on and uh, live your own life. So the family in that sense is transitional, enabling people to uh, live successfully or set up successfully on their, on their own. Now, um, the question he raised in this debate that I find interesting is, was the American founding set up merely to protect individual rights? And of course, when you go to the Bill of Rights, you see these individual rights specified, the right to free speech, the right to assemble, the right to own a gun, and so on. But the, the, um, 
Defenders of this notion of the common good say that the founding is about more than that. that the founding also enables and empowers the states to do all kinds of things that go way beyond that. Uh, states, for example, are allowed to, to pass laws that promote uh, the common good in all kinds of ways. And uh, in that sense, it is wrong to see the founding as a purely Lockean uh, compact uh, around individual rights. Let's look at this. States, for example, have traditional common law police powers. They can promote public health. They can promote public safety. They can promote public morality. States have run schools and hospitals and homeless shelters. States can restrict um, or, or limit prostitution, narcotics, obscenity. Uh, states offer things like recycling, leaf removal. They have building codes, zoning laws. Uh, there are also things like national days of prayer, Thanksgiving. Some states have uh, Sunday um, blue laws uh, in which uh, liquor stores are closed. Other types of stores are closed. And uh, the defenders of the uh, common good also say that rights exist, but their key um, uh, proviso is they exist up to a point. And uh, by this up to a point is, by the way, a clause that comes out of George Will's book uh, going back to the 1980s. It's somewhat tellingly titled Statecraft as Soulcraft. And in some ways, I think Will goes a little too far with all that because he's it's a little difficult to see what the stopping point is in state power if the state is in charge not just of your pocketbook, but also of your soul. What? Uh, but what, one of the points Will does make is he says that rights have a kind of, they have to be reasonable. So yeah, you have a right to free speech. And as long as free speech is promoting discussion, debate, perhaps even artistic self-expression, okay. But what, what happens when speech is going into um, obscenity, um, defamation, intimidation, extortion, incitement to violence? Well, the argument is at a certain point, and you may want to put that point pretty far out because there's obviously going to be gray areas, but Will's argument is that there is a point at which we would say enough. No, that's not what free speech is meant to do. Similarly, there's freedom to marry. Yeah, we have a freedom to marry, but we do say, the wait a minute, you can't exercise that freedom to marry at the age of 12. Uh, you can't exercise the freedom to marry and marry seven people at the same time. Um, so there are restrictions on marriage. It depends upon how you define marriage. And so it's um, so the people who say freedom to marry act as if all definitional restraints have got to be chucked uh, out the window, and it's up to the individual to decide when, who, where, when, and to whom um, they get married. And so, again, freedom to marry, yes, but to a point. And I think the deeper point being made here is this, that freedom in general is for something. I'm abstracting from the specific cases of free speech and marriage, that freedom has a goal. And the goal for the American founders wasn't just the free society, but the prosperous society and the decent society and the orderly society and the society in pursuit of truth. And so the point is, uh, and this is what, this is the common good. This is the goal. Freedom, you may say, is the means to pursue that goal. And so you want a wide orbit for freedom and you do want a limited national government and the defenders of the common good um, um, jurisprudence or the common good philosophy don't deny that there should be a limited federal government, but they also think that at the state level and at the local level, you should have communities that not just individually, but also collectively you, through the democratic process, through the constitutional process are promoting not just individual rights, not just um, individual freedom, but also some shared conception of the common good. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.